Good morning. The Duke of Edinburgh. Is there honestly anything now left to say that actually needs saying? It's a pointed question, but it's an unignorable one when we're talking about a man so intolerant of pretension, of fake emotion, flattery, or indeed the self-importance of journalists. He wouldn't want what he'd probably call an hour of repetitive poppycock. Well, I'm going to do my best to persuade you there is still food for thought about his life and role and people you will be pleased to hear from. I'm joined today by someone who was able to cast an insider's eye on the role Prince Philip played within both family and constitution, the former Prime Minister Sir John Major. By someone who, as trouble boils up again in Northern Ireland, can shed light on a perhaps unexpected aspect of the Duke, the former President of Ireland, Mary McAleese. And the former Archbishop of York, John Sentamu, who knew him well and discussed his faith with him. The Duke had many friends in many different worlds, and I'll be talking to one of them, the actor Joanna Lumley, about the man behind the pomp. There is other news, of course. Tomorrow is a big day in the easing of coronavirus restrictions. We'll be talking about that and a major lobbying scandal with Helen Lewis from The Atlantic and our very own Politics Live presenter, Joe Coburn. Let's start with the news from Ben Thompson. Andrew, thank you. Good morning. A service of remembrance is being held at Canterbury Cathedral this morning in memory of the Duke of Edinburgh. Members of the royal family, including Prince Charles, have been paying tribute to Prince Philip, who died aged 99 on Friday. My dear papa was, uh, was a very special person who, I think above all else, would have been amazed by the reaction and the touching things that have been said about him. Meanwhile, it's been confirmed the Duke's funeral will take place next Saturday. Due to current coronavirus restrictions, only 30 people, expected to be the Duke's children, grandchildren and other close family, can attend the ceremony at St George's Chapel in Windsor. In other news, there is one day to go until Covid restrictions are relaxed further in England. As of tomorrow, non-essential shops can open, as well as pubs, cafes and restaurants for customers who are seated outdoors. And there was a sensational win for racing and for Rachel Blackmore. She became the first female jockey to win the Grand National, riding 11 to 1 shot, Manella times. That's all the news for me for now. The next on BBC One is at 1 o'clock. Andrew, back to you. Very many thanks for that. And now today's review of the news. I'm going to go through the front pages in just a moment, but I should explain something. Normally you would expect an array of current politicians, but in the middle of eight days of national mourning, none of them will come on. Indeed, election campaigning across Scotland, Wales and parts of England is suspended. And so to the front pages, there's been some criticism of broadcasters, including the BBC, for doing too much about the Duke of Edinburgh. But it has to be said, all the papers take the same view. Virtually every single one has nothing else on the front page. There's the Sunday Express. Charles speaking yesterday. Charles, my dear papa. The Sun on Sunday focuses on the possibility of reconciliation between William and Harry. A lot of people will be talking about that today. Harry to walk behind the coffin with Wills, it says. Meghan, of course, is not coming because she's heavily pregnant. The Mail on Sunday, Charles, my dear papa, was so very special. Uh, the Mirror, united in grief. And the Sunday Telegraph, my dear papa, was a very special person. I miss him enormously. There are, however, other stories in the papers. Uh, the Observer has a story about virus hotspots around the UK and their warning of the possibility of a third wave as we unlock. And if you pick up the Sunday Times this morning, that's the first thing you see, Prince Philip, 1921 to 2021. But if you pull that aside, you see their real front page, as it were, and they're leading on this Greensill scandal. David Cameron in deep, deep trouble here, I think. Nuts email triggers fresh Greensill questions for the ex-Prime Minister. There are always lobbying scandals, but this appears to be a very serious one. And then again, Prince Charles paying tribute to his dear papa. 
Joe Coburn, let's just start talking about the, the, the royal coverage, the Duke of Edinburgh coverage. It is absolutely everywhere. There's a lot of good writing in all the papers, really. But you've, t you've taken the front page of the mail. Yes, I mean, you, you, you mentioned it. As you say, the papers are full of tributes and reflections and the life of the Duke of Edinburgh, as you would expect. But Charles, Prince Charles, saying, my dear papa, it's a very poignant and personal mm. tribute from him, particularly as it's been well documented over the years that the relationship between Prince Charles and his father was often complicated Wasn't and easy, was it? and could be strained. Mm. I suppose that is normal in, in many households. What's interesting, if you go into the Telegraph, if we just show you the inside here, as you mentioned, the headline says, Doctor's orders mean pregnant Duchess of Sussex must stay in the US as Harry flies back. He is indeed flying back, as you mentioned, the Duke of Sussex, unsurprisingly, to be with his family, with the royal family, ahead of Prince Philip. Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral next Saturday, which now has been confirmed. Um, but he will have to adhere to the COVID rules and he will have to self-isolate. And, of course, the limit that you mentioned of 30 people at that funeral uh, means that it will be the royal family and pretty well just them. Boris Johnson, for example, the not Prime going, Minister, not will not be attending because but he'll obviously want to give up his it's place. It's interesting that, that William and Harry will be there together for some considerable time. A lot of people are wondering, is this the moment they start to reconcile and mend that fractured relationship? Well, it would be a perfect opportunity, mm. won't it? Because they will be united as the rest of their family members in grief Indeed. and mourning for the Duke of Edinburgh, who was very much, as people will tell from the coverage over the last few days, very much the patriarch of that family from within as such. Now, in terms mm. of what's happening, you mentioned that uh, political campaigning for those very important elections on May the 6th in Scotland, in Crucial Wales, in England, in Scotland, elections, yeah. absolutely. Some of them uh, also deferred from last year because of the COVID pandemic. That has been suspended, the campaigning. For how long? Well, actually, it, it, there was some discussion about how long, and there was some talk that it could be uh, suspended for a whole week, which would have been pretty unprecedented, but these are unprecedented circumstances. We understand and we've been told now that full campaigning will resume on Tuesday. There could be some leafleting after tributes are made in the House of Commons, in the Senate in Wales and in Holyrood as politicians mm. will will be able to pay their own tributes and personal reflections to the Duke of Edinburgh in those respective Houses of Parliament. And perhaps from that point on, on Monday, some sort of campaigning will resume. Well, returning to the papers, if you're interested in reading more about the Duke of Edinburgh and his life, it's a pretty easy thing to find this morning. Uh, Helen Lewis, however, there have been lots of complaints um, around parts of the country that there's already been too much coverage. The, the, the nation no longer seems quite as united about these things as perhaps it once did. Yes, I thought it was interesting the BBC had to set up a sort of template for people to complain about the fact there was too much coverage, suggesting that they had quite a lot of complaints. And I think in the age of, you know, Netflix and streaming services, it was probably the wrong decision editorially to completely shut down BBC Two and run the same programmes as BBC One, to shut down BBC Four for the night. But it was probably the right decision politically. And by that, I mean the fact that annoying a lot of people who wanted to watch the MasterChef final is probably better for the BBC than annoying backbench Tory MPs who would then spend the whole weekend complaining about a, a lack of respect for the royal family and for Britain. And also those generations who would turn to the BBC for, as it were, old-fashioned, serious royal coverage in a moment like this. Right. And I thought that the BBC, you know, very much mm. did the Duke proud. Um, mm. in, in moments like this, it has the kind of the access and the production values to be able to provide that. But... I think it, you know, some of the coverage has actually strayed into the syrupy with some things about, you know, a nation in mourning. And it's very hard to see whether or not the nation's in mourning or not, because most of the nation is indoors. So some of those things did feel rather cliched, I thought. Yes. Um, uh, Joe was mentioning there, of course, the pause in politics. We're going to go through a period where we don't see many politicians around doing interviews about anything else. Um, and, of course, there's elections up and down the country. I'm thinking particularly about Scotland, where there's a very, very important election. Do you think there's any likelihood of, the, of these events affecting the, the performance of the SNP? I don't think anything looks like it's going to affect the performance of the SNP, including the launch of a new party by a former SNP leader in Alexander mm. Alba party. It, you know, it's a story of extraordinary dominance by, um, by the SNP that nothing, as far as polling shows, is, is denting so far. Right. Let, let's turn to the big political story we haven't properly mentioned so far, which is the Greensill lobbying story. 
uh, Joe. Yes, now, the I... Sunday Times has been pursuing this mm. for weeks now, yes, and they've got have. another very, very substantial series of stories. For people who haven't really been mm. following this, and it is a complicated one, just give us the sort of bare bones of it. Yes, if I can just remind people, I mean, the headline here that we are showing you in the Sunday Times, as you say, is Cameron David Cameron spent two months browbeating Rishi Sunak's officials in the Treasury. Um, this is all about a company called Greensill Capital, um, which is a privately owned financial services company. Um, its advisor was one David Cameron, um, Who former stood to make Prime a Minister. Huge amount of money. Out Absolutely. Of it. Yeah. So he was an advisor. He is allowed to be an advisor. There has always been this difficult relationship mm -hmm. between the access that certain companies can have if they have former politicians advising them or lobbying on their behalf. But you're absolutely right. He did have share options worth tens of millions of pounds. They aren't worth that now because the company Greensill itself ran into trouble, which is why they wanted to apply for taxpayer backed loans to help them and the company is actually set up it would say to loan and help small and medium sized businesses that could run into problem because of late payments that's mm. their sort now, of business model and it's not a stupid business model at all but Lex Greensill who runs the company is a friend of David Cameron and Rory. they met at number 10 he didn't get everything he wanted but he has had a huge amount of public money much of which may have gone forever well because of course the the, the company has gone into administration mm. and is now in as I say a great deal of trouble and that has left all sorts of unanswered questions yes. that the paper wants to put to David Cameron mm. um, and so far they say that they haven't had any comment or any response apart from through friends of David Cameron and yeah. that was specifically about texting Rishi Sunak perhaps he said he should have written a letter and the story Helen Lewis gets more and more tangled day by day. It's now about drinks with Matt Hancock, the health secretary. Uh, we've had lobbying scandals for years and years and years in this country. Is there something special about this because it's a former prime minister? I don't think there's anything special about it. In fact, what's kind of disturbing about it is that so far, most of it seems to be in, in, entirely within the rules, mm. which suggests there's a problem with the rules. But to put it perhaps slightly rudely, Cameron is yesterday's man. But what's more interesting is whether or not this touches Rishi Sunak and Matt Hancock. And, you know, those texts from Rishi Sunak released by the government in the last week show him giving really quite a polite brush off to David Cameron. Obviously, Treasury officials then had to take this request quite seriously. But there is a bigger issue here, not just in the jobs that might potentially be lost in the steel industry as a result of the collapse of this firm, but also about the fact that, you know, the government parceled a lot of money out of the door last year in various bounce back schemes, loans, COVID recovery. And was all that money really spent perfectly properly? You know, was there fraud of those schemes? The FT had a, a piece in December that's, that described it as a giant bonfire of taxpayers' money. And if that, you know, really begins to touch this government rather than a former prime minister, then it could really blow up into something quite extraordinary. Helen, thanks for that. Let's talk, Joe, about mm. another big story at the moment, a very unhappy one, which is the, the riots, the trouble on the streets running across Northern Ireland. Mm. Now, this is a very specific story. The Observer's got a story about that. Yes, the headline says Johnson refuses calls for summit on violence in Northern Ireland. As you say, this has been going on for eight days or eight nights. Uh, violence on the streets causing, of course, concern. Concern there, but also in Dublin and in London. And this story specifically says that, that the Westminster government, Boris Johnson's government, has turned down requests to hold a high-level intergovernmental mm. conference to try and stem the violence, to try and knock heads together, yeah. if you like. And the pressure coming from Dublin, I, I think if you read the, the, the piece in the newspaper, this is clearly where the, the, the story has from. come from. Yeah. Um, now, whether or not there has been an outright refusal and whether or not people are beginning to think, how can we actually bring people together to try and stop the violence. It's always very sensitive. It's always precarious if violence does erupt. There'll be those on the government side who say that there's any excuse yeah. uh, for small groups of thugs to actually yes. engage in this sort of violence. Others see this as a much, much more difficult and pernicious mm. problem. And they are young people, Helen, we're talking about. People far too young to remember uh, John Major and the peace process, still less Tony Blair. Uh, and the original Good Friday Agreement. And it is a complicated thing because clearly uh, the funeral of Bobby Story, um, the former IRA man, uh, during COVID restrictions has caused a lot of anger in Northern Ireland as well. But how much do you see this as really caused by Brexit? Well, yes, as you say, there was anger about the fact that Sinn Féin leaders attended that funeral in defiance of COVID restrictions, which played into a larger narrative of, you know, they can get away with whatever they want. 
But while I wouldn't say this is entirely caused by Brexit, it would be wrong also and kind of cowardly to not say that Brexit had a part of it. Uh, John Major and Tony Blair notoriously went to Derry, Londonderry, during the Brexit campaign, stood on the Peace Bridge and warned about the effect of Brexit on the region. And the fact is that Northern Ireland has ended up being treated differently to the rest of Britain and to the unionist community that is literally the opposite of what they want. So I think this has got to be bumped up a couple of notches up the government's priority mm. list, frankly. Turning to um, the inevitable COVID stories, Janssen, which is yet another jab, is about to become available. I mean, this is wonderful news, particularly because this is a one-shot jab. So if you've got communities which are a bit vaccine hesitant or you're worried you might not be able to get back in for a second jab, you, it's one and done. So I think particularly for younger people, particularly given the concerns over the AstraZeneca vaccine for the under 30s, having you know more options, including a one-dose option, is is brilliant one. And it does look like we might mm. hit that target um, of the summer. Some good news there. Joe, I mentioned the front page of The Observer a moment ago, talking mm. about worrying hotspots yes. in the black country and other parts, of the, you know, if we open up too quickly. The flip side of that story, I suppose, is in The Telegraph. Yes, well, here it is, exactly that. Half of people in England live in areas that are COVID-free. And there are two maps to help you see exactly where the hotspots are and where they are not. But, of course, logic would suggest that half of people, the other half in England, are living in areas that are not completely completely COVID free. So while again, there'll be these competing pressures that we have seen time and again um, tomorrow, we'll talk about in just a moment, is going to be another stage in the unlocking programme mm. um, in England. The issue here is that if there are hot spots across the country where the levels of infections perhaps aren't coming down as quickly, what is the risk? What is the risk? Exactly. And to be clear, we can talk about the detail, but um, non-essential retail, all shops effectively will be able to open in England from it's a bit, tomorrow. It is. It's a big day and outdoor hospitality. Outdoor. So, so basically, in this foul weather, you're, you're going to be able to go and shop and buy things you don't need just for the joy of shopping and then stand outside in the rain with your pint. I think the weather isn't going to be an obstacle for a, a great mm. many people, it has to be said. Um, and, of course, there are other stages of unlocking in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Because the in Scotland, the non-essential retail has already opened, yes. but school will be able to, if they can, depending on their term, term times, times yeah. they can return. Um, in Northern Ireland, the remaining school years, 8 to 11, uh, are also going to be uh, returning to school. And importantly, in Wales, it's the travel in and out of the country. The Welsh that border will, opens. The Welsh border does open. That happens tomorrow. So it is a big day in terms of the staging, if you like, of that unlocking programme. It's a big day. Thanks both very much indeed. Helen, I hope you're going to enjoy a pint outside tomorrow. Joe, thank you both very much as well. And so, as I say, to the weather, which has been chilly with sunny patches, it's called Britain. Get over it. Over to Thomas Shakanafa in the weather studio. Thomas. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, the weather is certainly chilly out there and it's going to stay like it uh, over the next few days. Uh, for today, it's a case of sunny spells and also wintry showers. Uh, and some of us this morning woke up to uh, fresh dusting, even covering of snow. But I think overall we are talking about mostly dry and sunny weather across the UK through the course of this afternoon and indeed into tomorrow. Now, the temperatures with the Arctic air will not be rising very high at all. We're talking five degrees in Aberdeen, eight degrees in Hull and barely touching double figures across the south of the UK. Frosty night tonight and with a weather front just nudging in off the Atlantic, we are expecting a little bit of snow across parts of Wales, maybe the Midlands as well. You can see by early on Monday morning, the temperatures are around freezing or below throughout much of the UK. And then Monday itself, of course, the first day of the easing of the lockdown. We want some better weather. Well, it's not going to be much warmer, but at least there's going to be some sunshine around across the majority of the UK. The difference here in the West is that the clouds will increase and there will be some spits and spots of rain. And to be honest, it's not going to turn an awful lot milder as we go through the week. Not fantastic news. Now, it's almost exactly 10 years since the Queen and Prince Philip paid a historic state visit to Ireland, an important moment in the healing process between the two countries, which could have gone badly wrong but didn't. Mary McAleese was president of Ireland at the time and I spoke to her just before we came on air about the role of the Duke during that visit. He, uh, of course, accompanied her uh, on the four days of that visit, one of the longest state visits we've ever had in Ireland, but also but undoubtedly the most historic visit uh, since uh, no British monarch had set foot in the Republic of Ireland um, in a hundred years. 
And there were all those, uh, you know, they, there, there was all that baggage of history to be dealt with. So um, I don't think she, certainly neither of them exhibited any nervousness, but you could understand that the security was very high, concerns were high. So he was there, as she has described him in the past, as her rock. Um, but he was also there as, uh, you know, as a character in his own right, a man who had come on a mission as she had come. Uh, uh, both of them had come on this mission in their own right to try and heal history and to ensure that for the future, these two neighboring islands would be characterized by good neighborliness. And so it wasn't just, he wasn't just there um, as her company, if you like, her inevitable company. He was also there mm. making a statement. I mean, one of the um, one of the remarkable things um, that didn't happen on that visit was, of course, that he subsequently met Deputy uh, First Minister of Northern Ireland, Martin McGuinness, a uh, former member of the IRA. Uh, and he would probably have met him in Dublin um, at, on that visit if Sinn Féin had agreed. Uh, we had invited Martin McGuinness to all the events, um, but Sinn Féin had decided for their own reasons yes. not to support the visit and not to be there. And so he was willing even then, even uh, then to meet yeah. uh, people who had been so closely associated with the murder of a man who meant so much to him, Lord Mountbatten. Well, of course, Mountbatten was his mentor and in, in many ways yes. his, his ersatz father, I suppose, very, very close to him. And despite that murder, I wonder, did the Duke himself, was he really interested in reconciliation, holding out the hand of friendship to the IRA or to Sinn Féin, people who had been the enemies of the British state for so long? I was lucky to have an insight into the desire of both Her Majesty the Queen and Prince Philip for precisely that reconciliation. Um, I was surprised at the extent to which, first of all, they were both very knowledgeable about Irish history, very well read on Irish history, and also very, very up to date on contemporary Irish politics. Mm. But the other thing that struck me that day was the fact that I was talking to two people of faith, um, and it was a faith that demanded of them that they seek reconciliation and forgiveness. This really surprised me. Um, and I don't know why it should have, but it did. And they both gave me to understand that they really wanted to visit Ireland. They wanted it to be part of a process of reconciliation. They saw themselves as people who had a duty uh, to do whatever they could by way of bringing about that mm. reconciliation between neighbours. And so when they yeah. came in 2011, it was at the end of a long process. Uh, we had the Good Friday Agreement and there was a long, long uh, political journey uh, to get to the point where we could offer that visit to Her Majesty the Queen. And of course, when they both came, they were greeted very warmly. Why? Because people recognised in them, in every gesture and everything they did and, and in the speech that the Queen gave, they recognised people who, who weren't just mm. there as state visitors, but in some ways we're on a kind of pilgrimage of reconciliation. A, a, a personal pilgrimage. But you had an example when you were talking to him about the slight problem the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme had in Ireland. Yes, uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland, we have a scheme called Goshka, the President's Award, which is part of the international award scheme along with the Duke of Edinburgh's award. I think that's one of his great legacies is that investment in young people. But um, one of the things that worried me about, um, about the two schemes, particularly in relation to Northern Ireland, was that while they were members of the international award, there wasn't what you would call an energetic partnership between them that would encourage the maximum number of young people to get involved. There would be young people in Northern Ireland who wouldn't get involved, for example, in the Duke of Edinburgh's award, precisely because it was called after the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, How did and we he felt react that we could that? give good example and work together. And he was so enthusiastic about that. And it ended up, we worked together on that. Uh, he invited me to give the Duke of Edinburgh, to present the Duke of Edinburgh Awards in Belfast. I, in turn, invited him to pre present the President's Award, the Goshka Awards in Dublin, um, to give that example, to show what is possible mm -hmm. when people of goodwill focus on the future and not on the baggage of the past. Mary McAleese, it's impossible to, to end this conversation without asking about what's going on in Northern Ireland right now, because there's been a lot of trouble on the streets, a lot of rioting, and that has not stopped for any sense of mourning. Uh, can I ask you why you think it's happening? It's a complicated issue, I'm sure, but why do you think this is going on now? Well, I think it, there's nothing... 
Uh, Andrew, it's very familiar territory, and regrettably, it arises because they're in a vacuum, and there is undoubtedly a back vacuum, you know, of political leadership. There is the downstream consequence of Brexit, um, which, you know, when we go back to Brexit, we realise um, how little consideration was given um, in the pre in the planning uh, uh, of Brexit and the referendum of the impact it would have on Northern Ireland. There's all of that. Uh, but you're also dealing with young people, regrettably, who are still being taught to hate mm -hmm. and who are bringing that hatred, expressing it out on the streets. They are 13 and 14 years of age. What experience do they have of life? And when I think of the Duke of Edinburgh and how he could see how important it was to galvanise the, the curiosity and the wonder and the energy of youth and to give it a focus, as is done through the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Uh, these are young people, I guarantee you, none of them will ever have done a Duke of Edinburgh Award, unfortunately. You talk about political leadership on all sides. I wonder what you would like to see coming from the UK at the moment to help quell the, quell the violence, but also whether you think that the Bobby Story funeral was handled very well. Well, that funeral, of course, has now been the subject of a police inquiry, um, consideration by the DPP, and it's currently under review. I mean, at the end of the day, Northern Ireland is, is fundamentally, it is a UK problem. It is part and parcel of the UK currently, as you know. Under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, it was agreed that Northern Ireland would remain part of the United Kingdom um, un unless and until the people of Northern Ireland decided otherwise. The situation that has been created has come out of, regrettably, a resentment of the downstream consequences of Brexit. And I think that's, um, that's something that really... I think that we need to we really need to take on board the fact that many people do not understand the logistics, for example, of the protocol, how in fact the protocol attached to the agreement um, between the United Kingdom and the EU is of huge benefit and will for the future be of huge benefit to Northern Ireland, whereas Brexit itself left to its own devices was not going to be, but they're going to have the best of both worlds. Mary McAleese, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Now then, as Archbishop of York, John Sentamu had a ringside seat at many royal occasions. He knew the Duke of Edinburgh up close and pretty personal because they discussed their shared faith in detail, and he joins me now. Dr Sentamu, welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, you Good described morning, the Duke of Edinburgh as your sparring partner. What did you mean by that? They were, they were topics that were off limits. Um, whenever I met him, he would get into a conversation, something that he'd been thinking about, and then I also would give a very robust reply. So there wasn't just, hello, how are you, what are you doing? He always had something on his mind he wanted to, uh, to talk about. Um, you know, at the end of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry and we made our report, again, I meet him at Buckingham Palace. Um, and he comes and asks me about how it all was. You know, you must have had a very tough time listening to evidence which really was appalling. Um, and then we have about three, four minutes of real conversation. So it was never, um, hello, how are you? Let me go on. So, and there were areas we disagreed fundamentally about. And also he, he, he loves a very good conversation. Um, and he doesn't want either you to let him off or for you to be let mm. off. So it was always quite, um, I always walked away, energised, energised, energised. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the Stephen Lawrence affair there, because for many people, he was the absolute epitome of the old white British establishment in his bearskin hat and his uniform and all the rest of it. In terms of relations between different groups in Britain, do you think he was actually a reformer? Was he somebody worried about those issues? If you, if you said uh, you're a reformer, I think that's not a word you'd like to use. <laughs> The word I think I had him say to me uh, every time, that life constantly changes. And we've got to be uh, upfront about the changes that are coming. And if you do not change, um, you're really going to find it difficult. Hence, uh, in the Queen's uh, Golden Jubilee, in her speech, talked about change is a constant, and how we respond to it will determine our future. So he would talk about change. Please look around you. Everything is changing. There is nothing static. And uh, the only thing that is stable, we know that the earth is still revolving around, but the rest, I'm afraid, changes. And the good thing is to make sure that you are there to make a better change than a terrible one. And he thought that the Stephen Lawrence inquiry was really at the heart of it going to change 
the way we do our policing. And in many ways, it actually has done it. So he, he would go for change, not reform, because he said, I don't know what that means, because the powerful are the ones that want reform. And whom do they want reform? The weaker people. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about change, all of us are involved in it. That's really interesting because I guess I suppose he was also known. He complained about being seen as a caricature, but part of that caricature would be the off-colour remarks about other people's backgrounds and ethnicity and so forth. He was notorious for putting his foot in his mouth, as he used to say. But you, you would argue that there was an entirely different side to the man. He, he would make an off-course remark, and if somebody challenged him, they would enter into an amazing conversation. The trouble was because he... Uh, was the Duke of Edinburgh, the, the husband of the Queen, um, people had this kind of deference. But if you, I mean, if you charged them, I mean, I, I, I don't know how much time you've got, but when, when you know... Um, yeah, give us an example. He, well, I will give you an example. Um, I was telling a joke about, um, you know, black people and how some way they've been treated. And, um, and he comes to me and says to me, do you think that's fair? So I said, how would you describe the kind of incident I've been giving you? And then you talk about his Duke of Edinburgh Award. It was an eye open when this went into every country where he had been. And when he met young people, whether they were black, whether they're white, whether they're Asian, actually it didn't make a slightest difference as long as they were given the opportunity um, to get up in life. And the trouble with most of our people who feel downtrodden, they have not been given real opportunity. And my uh, award is intending to create a level playing field for everybody. So he, he um, yeah, I mean, he, he had this very quick witted sort of thing and then he just said something. And I'm sure sometimes he, um, he, he regretted some of those phrases, but in the end, it's a pity that people simply saw him as a, somebody who simply makes gaps. Behind those gaps was an expectation of a comeback that nobody came back and therefore unfortunately stayed. Everybody was too scared all the time as he was going around, I <laughs> yes, suppose. Yes, now, yes, yes. Close observers will have noticed that you are a man of strong and robust faith, and so was yes. he. Tell us a little yes. bit about his faith as you experienced it in those conversations. Um, I, think, I, think, I think the first time, I think it was the ambassador's uh, dinner at Buckingham Palace, and, and he really was give, feeling very, very sorry uh, for some of the things that were happening uh, in his family, particularly his sons. Um, and he said, you, you believe, don't you? I said, yes. Um, what would you say to me about the trouble that's happening with all my, fa my families? And I said, well, uh, Your Royal Highness, you are a family like any other family. And every family goes through good times and bad times. The important thing for me is that you should realize if people are married, they are not just a couple, there's a third, and that's Jesus Christ. And they should begin to go to Jesus Christ. And then and there was this pause. And then he says, of course, the, the queen and I are so strong in our belief in Christ. And fortunately, my siblings need to be given. Can you begin to pray for them? And there was I um, immediately stopping and saying a prayer. Um, so there, is, there, there was this unbelievable mm. depth of his rootedness because he was so rooted in Christ. He didn't have any problem in relating to people of other faiths or those who didn't believe at all or those who doubted what he, he was doing because his feet were so strong, rooted in Christ, rooted in reality, rooted in his family, that actually he could, he could, he could be a free person. And I have not actually... Um, met a couple that are so free, that, and her majesty is exactly the same. I mean, I have seen her and I've had audiences with her. Mm. And you go away at the end, last time I saw her, I said, your majesty, do you mind saying a prayer for me? And she takes my hands and there is a bit of silence. Um, and often their prayers were never uttered aloud, but you knew that at the end, both of us said amen. And I, I, I walked out of that room and I said the people were there. That was the most unbelievable experience. And of course, Philip was upstairs, um, not feeling very well. 
and grumbling about this and the other. And I said, oh, Majesty, that means he's actually getting better. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, of course, um, it's going to be a very strange funeral service, the one that we're going to yeah. see on Saturday. Just 30 or so people there wearing masks, socially distanced. A lot of people up and down the country will want to express their condolences, their grief, their feelings. How hard is it going to be this time under these restrictions, do you feel? Uh, and I think, you see, they restricted the, their own service to 30 people. Um, trying to keep the guidance. In other words, they're saying we're mm. not different from grief from anybody else. And as many people, in fact, some of them were never even able to go uh, to the barriers. Um, yeah. This year, the family are going to be present because the rules have been uh, you know, slightly altered. And so they want to be part of the grieving of the nation for the many people who died from COVID. And for those who've not been able to have their loved ones buried when they're being present. And I remember a, a rabbi who, who died and his family just could not go near. And I, and I appeared on, on television uh, challenging the, 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 um, the, home, the, the health secretary on how the rules could be altered. Thank God they did change them and allowed uh, some people socially distancing. I know the service very well because um, normally the service prepared for uh, the death of either the, the Duke or the Queen, they all agreed by the two Archbishops, Canterbury and Rome. So, the, so I know what would have been the content in it. It's going to be so truncated in order to allow it not to go on. And of course, the Duke did not stand what you call long church. Mm. <laughs> mm. He, he, um, so the service is not going to be on because you people of the BBC uh, are going to be broadcasting the service live. So everybody in their homes throughout the world will be able to join and participate in that, um, that, they that, will. that service. They yeah, will. They will. Mm -hmm. And if there was a modern technology, that would have been very, very impossible. I'm hoping that at some future time, some future place, there will be a real service of thanksgiving for the life of, uh, of the Duke. We'll wait to see. Dr. Sentamu, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. Much appreciated. Joanna Lumley, the actor and activist, was also a friend of the Duke of Edinburgh for decades. They shared a close interest in the environment and the welfare of groups such as the Gurkhas. I spoke to her just before we came on air and I asked her, while many people may think of the Duke as being a somewhat cantankerous man, others remember his great sense of humour. So which was it for her? I just really had the great pleasure of being quite often put beside him at dinners or attending some of his charity things. I remember particularly one, one time when I was, I was in Scotland and I was coming down for a Burma Star event at the Imperial War Museum. And my plane was late, delayed, and I rushed and rushed and rushed. And uh, Countess Mountbatten of Burma was there and they'd arranged on the top steps of that great building. They'd got chairs there and there was a huge parade going on. And I sneaked up around the side and just got there, um, creep, 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 creep in. The Duke of Edinburgh is there with his eagle eyes. Andrew, he had an extraordinary way of just suddenly turning and spotting you. you know, nothing mm. escaped his eagle gaze. And afterwards, he said, you were late. And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I had to come down from Scotland. And he said, so did I, <laughs> forgetting, <laughs> forgetting that I'd yeah. come on a humble old sort of ordinary plane. But however, afterwards at lunch, where I was sitting next door to him, um, a man on his right had suddenly started to talk about hunting and shooting and fishing and things like this. I think Prince Philip had noticed that I was having a vegetarian um, meal beside him. And in some extraordinarily subtle way, he turned, he turned the conversation quietly without being rude to the man, right away from that, and just talked. He was such a, he was very kind, you know. I think that's quite often overlooked. He was very funny and very sharp, but very kind. And, and sensitive and interested in all sorts of things, including the environment, as you are as well. Um, this is a man who actually uh, applauded activism. I've said that you're an actor and an activist, and many people would assume the Duke of Edinburgh would rather look down on activism as a sport, but he didn't. I, I, yes, and I, I think he was... I think he liked vigour. He liked get up and go. He liked... He didn't like whingers and moaners. He liked people who challenged themselves. And then, for the very humble and the very frail and the very nervous, I think he was kind and just... The whole of the Duke of Edinburgh's award is, is to make people better, see the best of themselves. And I think he did that when talking to people as well. Um, I did a television programme where I interviewed him about his collection of art, his interest in art. And instead of uh, maybe going, taking me around the great paintings of Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle, he took me and this tiny film crew 
to the little cottages that the royal family has at Sandringham, which are just hum humble little ordinary farm workers' cottages, where he and the royal family go to stop being royal, as it were, um, which I thought was extraordinarily open and sweet of him to do that. And hanging on the wall, there were all kinds of paintings, Edward Seagull and people expected, but also um, I seem to remember there was Aboriginal art. And I know that he was one of the first people ever to commission Aboriginal art and Inuit artifacts, you know. He, he, he had an extraordinary interest, a good painter himself too. Mm. Um, just, a, just a very, very broad, broad, everything, everything interested him, particularly stuff that that was going on, you know. So I think mm. activism, I, do, I mean, I think it's rather an odd word because it just means that you're passionate about things. Yeah. I think he admired passion and energy. And the environment in particular? I think so. I mean, when you think how far ahead he was realising that, that this perfect world we live in can only be ruined by human beings. Because even if there are natural catastrophes, they recover from it. But they can't really recover from human cruelty and indifference, which is the way we are treating the planet. So he was always interested in those sorts of things. Um, he was invigorating company because you couldn't slop by when you you couldn't just get by. You had to be on your, t mm. on your toes, listening, listening, listening. And sometimes I suppose it could be a snap remark. But it was only out of interest and, and impatience and... Yeah, I mean, he could be a little scary. I remember finding him a bit scary. He had that kind of slightly prickly, grumpy side. But I guess a lot of sensitive people have that to protect themselves. Is that how you saw it? Yes. I never sort of analysed it that much, because, after all, he was my father's age. You know, he was mm. from a different generation, and we venerated old, uh, older people so very much. And he and the Queen had been in my life as, ever since I saw them on the coronation film when I was a child out in Malaya, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, as it is now. And so they were, they were sort of massively uh, important and revered figures. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really, when I was with him, assess him much. But afterwards, it struck me that he, he had maybe quite shy. I think Giles Brandreth said it was a sort of reserve he'd built up around him, maybe from his childhood. Anyway, he was... Uh, I don't think he let, he, he wouldn't have let ordinary people like me into, into him, but I think he revealed a lot by simply the way he was and the way he talked about things that he was passionate and interested in. We're now uh, mourning him. What about his legacy? How do you think, as someone who knew him, he's going to be remembered, or should be remembered, I should say? Not going to be, but should. Oh, well, I think he actually is going to be remembered for the most extraordinary thing, the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, which literally looked at all children and said, anybody can do this, anybody can do this. It doesn't matter what your background is or what your abilities are, what your capabilities are, you can do this and you will come out better and stronger. And all the young all over who I've heard talking about it, and indeed I was part of several of the ceremonies at Buckingham Palace, handing out certificates, you know, the gold, silver and bronze, and meeting the young people there and their proud parents mm. who saw their children blossoming. I think his legacy will be how he changed the minds of young people and made them believe in themselves. That's a very rare and difficult thing to do. And he did it in spades. That's a he pretty was... good legacy. Pretty yeah. good legacy. Joanna Lumley, thank you so much for talking to us. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. 1992 was famously the Queen's Annus Horribilis, the failure of three of her children's marriages and then the fire at Windsor Castle. Now, the Prime Minister at the time, the man who had to help support the royal family and sort out difficult financial problems, was my next guest, Sir John Major. He was later appointed Special Guardian to Princes William and Harry, and through all of that, of course, he dealt with the late Duke of Edinburgh pretty regularly. Sir John, welcome. Good Fondest morning. memory? Oh, well, there were so many. Um, perhaps for this moment I could give you an early memory. I had uh, just been elected leader of the Conservative Party. And I bumped into Prince Philip and he, he came up looking extremely mischievous and he said, I see your party are electing outsiders now. He knew what it was like to be an outsider. Mm, of course he did. And he often came up with very cryptic remarks like that. Now, one thing that you shared, I know, is an enthusiasm for cricket, which involves sitting down for many, many hours and watching test matches, sometimes together. Um, what kind of conversations were you having? I would think it was quite fairly intimidating to be sitting next to the Duke of Edinburgh for that long. <laughs> it wasn't intimidating at all, because we either talked about cricket or we watched the cricket. 
Nothing is more irritating in life than somebody sitting at your side, babbling away when you're trying to enjoy a cricket match. Uh, I felt that way, and so did the Duke. But what did happen about cricket, frequently, when we met on uh, occasions, he would sidle up to me with a grin on his face and say, what's the cricket score if there was a test match or an important game on? Mm. He, he had an interest in it. He was an off-break bowler. Uh, he had an interest in it. Um, he'd been president of the MCC twice, I think, twice. Mm. And, and he maintained an interest in cricket, as in other sports, throughout his life. Now, I mentioned the Anna Cerebralis there, of course, 1992. You had a lot of engagement with the royal family, lots to talk about, lots of difficulties happening, including over money. And just, I wonder to what extent, people talk about this being almost like a joint monarchy. He was very, very involved in his decisions. Did you get an impression that he was engaged from, from the, the palace side in taking decisions, in negotiating the way through? Well, he, of course, he wasn't so indiscreet as to talk about it mm. in quite that clarity. Uh, but I had not the slightest doubt from my, uh, from my discussions with the Queen and with him that he was very much involved with what, with what was happening. It was, of course, an uh, Anna Cerebelli. There was more than one of them. Mm. Um, he had them, and they rather coincided with mine. I had the odd difficulty <laughs> at, the same, at the same time, I recall, uh, with a little help from my friends. Um, and, of course, we discussed those issues, uh, mm. and there was no doubt about the depth and concern of Prince Philip for what the monarchy was facing, and in particular the Queen. Now, he was very involved, as you said, in understanding politics, took a close interest in politics. There was a famous moment, I think, in Ghana, when he was asked about the Ghanaian parliament, and he was told there were 200 Ghanaian MPs, and he said something like, I've got it here, he said, quite right, that's about the right number. We have 650, and most of them are a complete bloody waste of time. Does that really reflect his view of parliament, <laughs> do you think? Um, I'm not sure. You'd, you'd, uh, you'd have to ask someone who knows him better than I do. Mm. Uh, I rather agree with him about the number of MPs. I think there are too many, and there are certainly far too many in the Lords. I think that is, uh, that is self-evident. But often those remarks that he made that were regarded as gruff mm. and sometimes caused offence, I think they were remarks to put people at ease more than anything else. It wasn't Break an attempt ice. to be offensive. He was trying to put people who were nervous at meeting him. Mm. If you're meeting the Queen or Prince Philip for the first time, if you're a normal person, you're nervous. And his determination was to put people at ease and by saying something from left field, something that's a bit anti-establishment, mm. because Parliament is the establishment, of course, uh, that does create a different perception in the mind and eyes of the people who meet him. It relaxes them. Mm. And I think that is what he's about. I mean, he often suffered extremely bad headlines and stories as a result mm. of that. And offended people, too, presumably. And, yeah, indeed. Yeah. But I think that is what he was about. Mm. Um, now, apart from cricket and apart from some of the aspects of politics, what do you think really drove him in terms of his, as it were, broader political passions? What excited him? Well, um, I think he was excited by things that worked and things that had an element of compassion underneath them. Mm. I think that was the driving force for the Duke of Edinburgh's award. It really was a remarkable thing that he began. And, of course, it was aimed not exclusively, it was aimed at all young people. But I think it was particularly aimed at young people who weren't sure they could meet their potential. He wanted to show them that they could meet their potential. Here were things that they could learn to do that perhaps they thought they couldn't do. And if in doing that it gave them, it gave them confidence, mm. helped them mark out what their future might be, well, so much the better. And it was amazingly successful. And his compassion for that was absolutely genuine. And, of course, it spread, I think, probably far further, uh, far wider, yeah. and for far longer than he possibly imagined. But it was indicative of what lay underneath mm. the graph, the occasional graph manner. It was the real Philip, I think, who mm. appeared when he, uh, when he pursued that. If there's one phrase that everybody uses about him, he said he was great support to the Queen. But I wonder, what did that actually mean? Well, consider the position the Queen is in. She is the head of state. That is a very lonely position in many ways. There are a limited number of people to whom she can really open her heart, to whom she can really speak with total frankness, to whom she can say things that would be reported by other people and thought to be indelicate. Of the handful of people to whom she can speak frankly, 
Her husband, Prince Philip, was obviously the first one. And I'm sure that happened. That is why I think the Queen said at a later stage that he was her, 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 her great stay Phantom and support. Stay, yeah. at, at times of difficulty, he was the person who was there. He was the person to whom she could unburden herself. And when you're facing a sea of problems, as she so often was, and sometimes when you're overwhelmed by what has to be done, someone who understands that, someone who can take part of the burden, someone who can share the decision-making, someone who can metaphorically, or in the case of Prince Philip, I think probably uh, literally, put their arms around you and say, it's not as bad as you think, this is what we have to do, this is how we can do it, this is what I think. I think when you talk of him being a great support, that was it. If you saw them at receptions together, the Queen would lead, Prince Philip would be behind, but it would be Prince Philip who would often bring people up to meet the Queen who were too nervous to meet them, mm. to, uh, to meet her. So in every way, I think he was which an astonishing support. Which leads sort of inevitably to the question, how will she manage without him? Well, it will be difficult. Um, there are no doubt millions of people watching this programme who have lost a partner, a spouse. And it is a very lonely time. Uh, the Queen and Prince Philip had 73 years of marriage together. That is extraordinary. I can think of no one else who's had a marriage of that length in my experience. So it will be an enormous hole in her life that suddenly Prince Philip isn't there. How will the Queen manage? Well, I think there are several things to say about that. Firstly, I hope she will be given some time and space. I know she is the monarch. I know she has responsibilities but she has earned the right to have a period of privacy in which to grieve with her family. Mm -hmm. After that, I think there are two things effectively to say. Firstly, Prince Philip may physically have gone, but she will be in the Queen's mind as clearly as if she were sitting opposite him. She will hear his voice metaphorically in her ear. Mm -hmm. She will know what he will say in certain circumstances. He will still be there in her memory. His loud echo is there still. The echo will be there, and it always will be. It is with very close relationships. And I think after that, the Queen is both a Stoic and a remarkable uh, public servant. She will return to her work, but I do hope she's given a little space okay. and a little time and a little freedom to grieve in the way anybody else would wish to do so after having lost their spouse. Let me ask you about him as a father and as a grandfather. You were a special guardian uh, for Harry and William during a very difficult time. Tell us a little bit about the support he offered them. Well, I saw more of Prince Charles and the boys than I did of uh, Prince Philip. But, of course, he spoke to me about it. And he was deeply concerned to make sure that they were getting proper care. And they were. The first time I went to see Prince Charles in the capacity of guardian ad litem. The two boys were there. They were very young still, if you remember. It was a tragic time in 1997. So they were still quite young. But the affection between Prince Charles and the boys was evident. And so in terms of being a guardian, I had nothing to do with their, 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 their emotional care. That was in very good hands with their family, mm. and that included mm. Prince Philip. Now, of course, um, there's been a lot of trouble since then. And there is now a funeral coming where the whole family will be together. Uh, cardinal Vincent Nichols, the, uh, the Roman Catholic uh, cardinal, has said that many a family gather and get over tension and broken relationships at the time of a funeral. Something very profound unites them all again, and that would be true for this family, I am sure. Do you agree with that? Uh, I'm sure he's right. I hope he's right, I believe he is right, and I certainly hope so. The friction that we are told has arisen is a friction better ended as speedily as possible. And a shared emotion, a shared grief at the present time because of the death of their father, of their grandfather, I think is an ideal opportunity. I hope very much that it is possible to mend any rift that may exist. 
Now, he was, um, he was a reformer, of course, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh at the beginning of his time, very active, challenging what he thought was st stuffy a protocol and the way that things were done. Now, do you think if somehow he could be back now as a young man again, he'd be reforming the monarchy again? Is this an institution that has to keep changing to survive? I, was, he, I mean, I think he was an evolving reformer. Mm. He didn't want to tear things down and start again. He just wanted to ensure that it uh, kept pace with modern times. And if you consider... Not all your listeners will remember the monarchy as it was in the early 1950s when uh, uh, Her Majesty became Queen. But it has moved an enormous amount, mm. uh, faster in the last 50 years than in any previous 150 at any stage. And I think Prince Philip would have been one of the guiding forces uh, behind that. But the Queen too, of course. Mm. I mean, I remember when it was made evident to me at the time I was Prime Minister that the Queen thought it was right for her to pay tax. And so there is a constant consideration of reform. And I think the, the Duke, the Duke as a young man, where well, he's still a young man, um, would, mm. would be keen to see the monarchy evolve so that it retains its rationale, it retains its centrality, its importance to uh, British life. Mm. It is extraordinarily important. You're seeing it now with the number of people who have never met the Duke who would never have dreamed of meeting the Duke, but they are upset mm. that the Duke has died. You have probably had the same experience that I have. People have phoned Norma and I from abroad to express their condolences to us because the Duke has died, because they know us and they don't know the they Duke. Don't know him. Now, that will have been multiplied right across the United Kingdom and only, only I think, damped down by the uh, wretched effect of this virus at the present time. Now, one thing which doesn't unite us is that I wasn't invited to Harry and Meghan's wedding, and you were. I wonder, will you be attending the funeral? I have absolutely no idea. I think funerals tend to be family occasions, but I have absolutely no idea who will be attending at all. We talked about, about sort of change and reform. Because nature takes its course, inevitably takes its course, we are probably living through the final act of the great Elizabethan age, of this Elizabethan age. Have you any reflections on how the monarchy might have to change in the next period? Well, I think, we're going to be, I think and hope there are going to be quite a lot of curtain calls over the, uh, next, uh, mm. over, over the next few years. I think it is evolving. The, the, the central portion of the royal family has become more evident in the last few years. Mm. You can see that gradual change occurring. So a smaller royal family at the core, perhaps. A smaller, smaller core taking a higher profile. And I think over the next few years, uh, for a raft of reasons, mm. and not least uh, the Queen's venerable age, you, you will see uh, Prince Charles and mm. Prince William and other members of the family taking a greater role the burden will be spread yes. a little wider, yes. uh, a little deeper than it has been in the past. I think those changes will come. Yeah. People often overlook how much the royal family has opened up in the last uh, few decades. I think that is going to uh, mm. continue. Mm. I don't think we're going to become a bicycling royal family, if I can put it in that way. But I do think they are becoming more open, more evident, more aligned to what happens these days. And particularly as the wider members of their family make that difficult step away from the, the, the royal centrality and form yeah, lives of their own mm -hmm. amongst mm -hmm. the grandchildren, mm -hmm. that, that will speed it up, I think. Now, um, you are no longer Prime Minister and therefore when the House of Commons resumes, you will not be speaking for the nation, as it were, about this. But if you were, what would you be saying now to the country about the Duke of Edinburgh? Well, I would be expressing my admiration for the way he has behaved as consort to the Queen for so long. I would uh, recall a point I made earlier about him being her uh, stay and strength. That is absolutely true, and now that stay and strength is no longer there. But the people they have cared about for the last 70 years, the four nations of the United Kingdom, the 50 nations of the Commonwealth, the people within it, their family, they are still all around. And I think it might be a nice legacy for Prince Philip if we began to return to the Queen some of the support that she has given to the country, to the Commonwealth, to the family, to the nation during this difficult period of time. I think it is something we owe the Queen. I think it would be a good legacy for Prince Philip. I very much hope that that is what happens. I think it would be 
a wonderful tribute to him were it to do so. Sir John Major, thanks very much indeed for talking to us this morning. That is all from me. Thanks to all of my guests and to you for watching. I'll be back here next week at 9 o'clock for a more normal programme, but until then, goodbye. <laughs>